Refugee by Alan Gratz, a first chapter Friday read aloud video with the word nerd. Hi, my name is Amanda Ziva. Welcome to my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd, and another First Chapter Friday video. This week, I'm going to be sharing with you Refugee by Alan Gratz. And as I talk to you about this book, I'm going to lean on a quote from the front cover that says, Some novels are engaging and some novels are important. Refugee is both. As you can tell from the title, this story is going to cover a very important topic, one that has been happening for a very long time and one that still continues to happen. And part of Alan Gratz's goal in writing this book was to share the experience of refugees so that other people can better understand what it is like. Um, that's one of my favorite things about fiction is that even though you don't know about something or experience it in your own real life, you can step into the character's shoes and see what it is really like and therefore broaden your own life experiences, build empathy, compassion, awareness, and hopefully move into action so that we can all um, make the world a better place. I'm going to read to you uh, what the book is about and then share a few resources in the back before we dive into the story. Three different kids, one mission in common, escape. Joseph is a Jewish boy living in 1930s Nazi Germany. With the threat of concentration camps looming, he and his family board a ship bound for the other side of the world. Isabel is a Cuban girl in 1994. With riots and unrest plaguing her country, she and her family set out on a raft, hoping to find safety in America. Mahmoud is a Syrian boy in 2015. With his homeland torn apart by violence and destruction, he and his family begin a long trek toward Europe. All three kids go on harrowing journeys in search of refuge. All will face unimaginable dangers from drownings to bombings to betrayal. But there is always the hope of tomorrow. And although Joseph, Isabel, and Mahmoud are separated by continents and decades, shocking connections will tie their stories together in the end. Acclaimed author Alan Gratz delivers an action-packed novel that tackles topics both timely and timeless. Courage, survival, and the quest for home. Um, I'm going to read you the first chapter of each of these three different uh, journeys, these three different children, so that you can be immersed a little bit into each of their worlds. Um, and I also want you to know in the back of the book, when you're done reading, or maybe even as you are reading, um, there's great back matter material. You'll get a map of each child's journey and um, you'll be able to track and see where they are in the world and how uh, they are progressing um, as you go through the novel. There's also some additional information about each of the history and true facts and research about each of the children um, in the back. And one other important note that I wanna share um, and that is that Alan Gratz decided to donate a portion of the proceeds from the sale of this book um, to UNICEF to support the relief efforts with refugee children around the world. And that's kind of what I was talking about earlier, that like fiction is powerful. Fiction not only helps us create empathy and understand other people's emotions and experiences, but it can lead to action and doing great things um, to help others. So uh, yay books. The first chapter is coming from Joseph's perspective in Berlin, Germany, 1938. Crack, bang. Joseph Landau shot straight up in bed, his heart racing. That sound. It was like someone had kicked in the front door. Or had he dreamt it? Joseph listened, straining his ears in the dark. He wasn't used to the sounds of this new flat, the smaller one he and his family had been forced to move into. They couldn't afford the old place, not since the Nazis told Joseph's father he wasn't allowed to practice law anymore because he was Jewish. Across the room, Joseph's little sister Ruth was still asleep. Joseph tried to relax. Maybe he'd just been having a nightmare. Something in the darkness outside his room moved with a grunt and a scuffle. Someone was in the house. Joseph scrambled backward on his bed, his eyes wide. There was a shattering sound in the next room. Krish! Ruth woke up and screamed, screamed in sheer blind terror. She was only six years old. Mama, Joseph cried. Papa. Towering shadows burst into the room. The air seemed to crackle around them like static from a radio. Joseph tried to hide in the corner of his bed, but shadowy hands snatched at him, grabbed for him. He screamed even louder than his sister, drowning her out. He kicked and flailed in panic, but one of the shadows caught his ankle and dragged him face first across his bed. Joseph clawed at his sheets, but his hands were too strong. Joseph was so scared he wet himself, the warm liquid spreading through his nightclothes. 
No, Joseph screamed. No. The shadows threw him to the floor. Another shadow picked up Ruth by her hair and slapped her. Be quiet, the shadow yelled, and it tossed Ruth down on the floor beside Joseph. The shock shut Ruth up, but only for a moment. Then she wailed even harder and louder. Hush, Ruthie, hush, Joseph begged her. He took her in his arms and wrapped her in a protective hug. Hush now. They cowered together on the floor as the shadows picked up Ruth's bed and threw it against the wall. Crash! The bed broke into pieces. The shadows tore down pictures, pulled drawers from their bureaus, and flung clothing everywhere. They broke lamps and light bulbs. Joseph and Ruth clung to each other, terrified and wet-faced with tears. The shadows grabbed them again and dragged them into the living room. They threw Joseph and Ruth on the floor once more and flicked on the overhead light. As Joseph's eyes adjusted, he saw the seven strangers who had invaded his home. Some of them wore regular clothes, white shirts with sleeves rolled up, gray slacks, brown wool caps, leather work boots. More of them wore the brown shirts and red swastika armbands of the Sturlimbittelung, Adolf Hitler's stormtroopers. Joseph's mother and father were there, too, lying on the floor at the feet of the brown shirts. Joseph! Ruth! Mama cried when she saw them. She lunged for her children, but one of the Nazis grabbed her nightgown and pulled her back. Aaron Landau, one of the brown shirts, said to Joseph's father, You have continued to practice law despite the fact that Jews are forbidden to do so under the Civil Service Restoration Act of 1933. For this crime against the German people, you will be taken into protective custody. Joseph looked at his father, panicked. This is all a misunderstanding, Papa said. If you just give me a chance to explain. The brown shirt ignored Papa and nodded at the other men. Two of the other Nazis yanked Joseph's father to his feet and dragged him toward the door. No, Joseph cried. He had to do something. He leapt to his feet, grabbed the arm of one of the men carrying his father, and tried to pull him off. Two more of the men jerked Joseph away and held him as he fought against them. The brown shirt in charge laughed. Look at this one, he said, pointing to the wet spot on Joseph's night clothes. The boys peed himself. The Nazis laughed, and Joseph's face burned hot with shame. He struggled in the men's arm, trying to break free. I'll be a man soon enough, Joseph told them. I'll be a man in six months and eleven days. The Nazis laughed again. Six months and eleven days, the brown shirt said, not that he's counting. The brown shirt suddenly turned serious. Perhaps you're close enough that we should take you to a concentration camp too, like your father. No, Mama cried. No, my son is just twelve. He's just a boy. Please, don't. Ruth wrapped herself around Joseph's leg and wailed, Don't take him! Don't take him! The brown shirt scowled at the noise and gave the men carrying Aaron Landau a dismissive wave. Joseph watched as they dragged Papa away to the sounds of Mama's sobs and Ruth's wails. Don't be so quick to grow up, boy, the brown shirt told Joseph. We'll come for you soon enough. The Nazis trashed the rest of Joseph's house, breaking furniture and smashing plates and tearing curtains. They left as suddenly as they had come, and Joseph and his sister and mother huddled together on their knees in the middle of the room. At last, when they had cried all the tears they could cry, Rachel Landau led her children to her room, put her bed back together, and hugged Joseph and Ruth close until morning. In the days to come, Joseph learned that his family wasn't the only one the Nazis had attacked that night. Other Jewish homes and businesses and synagogues were destroyed all over Germany, and tens of thousands of Jewish men were arrested and sent to concentration camps. They called it Crystal Knock, the night of broken glass. The Nazis hadn't said it with words, but the message was clear. Joseph and his family weren't wanted in Germany anymore, but Joseph and his mother and sister weren't going anywhere. Not yet. Not without Joseph's father. Mama spent weeks going from one government office to another trying to find out where her husband was and how to get him back. Nobody would tell her anything, and Joseph began to despair that he would never see his father again. And then, six months after he'd been taken away, they got a telegram. A telegram from Papa. He'd been released from a concentration camp called Dachau, but only on the condition that he leave the country within 14 days. Joseph didn't want to leave. Germany was his home. But where would they go? How would they live? But the Nazis had told them to get out of Germany twice now? and the Landau family wasn't going to wait around to see what the Nazis would do next. Isabel, just outside Havana, Cuba, 1994. It only took two tries to get the scrawny calico kitten to come out from under the pink cinder block house and eat from Isabel Fernandez's hand. The cat was hungry, just like everyone else in Cuba, and its belly quickly won out over its fear. 
The cat was so tiny it could only nibble at the beans. Its tummy purred like an outboard motor, and it butted its head against Isabel's hand in between bites. You're not much to look at, are you, kitty? Isabel said. Its fur was scraggly and dull, and Isabel could feel the cat's bones through its skin. The kitten wasn't too different from her, Isabel realized, thin, hungry, and in need of a bath. Elizabeth, Isabel was eleven years old and all lanky arms and legs. Her brown face was splotchy with freckles and her thick black hair was cut short for summer and pulled back behind her ears. She was barefoot like always and wore a tank top and shorts. The kitten gobbled up the last of the beans and mewed pitifully. Isabel wished she had something else to give it, but this food was already more than she could spare. Her lunch hadn't been much bigger than the cat's, just a few beans and a small pile of white rice. There had been rationing and food coupon books back when Isabel was little, but a few years ago, in 1989, the Soviet Union had fallen and Cuba had hit rock bottom. Cuba was a communist country, like Russia had been, and for decades the Soviets had been buying Cuba's sugar for 11 times the price and sending the little island food and gasoline and medicine for free. But when the Soviet Union went away, so did all their support. Most of the farms in Cuba grew only sugar cane. With no one to overpay for it, the cane fields dried up and the sugar refineries closed and people lost their jobs. Without Russia's gas, they couldn't run the tractors to change the fields over to food, and without the extra food, the Cuban people began to starve. All the cows and pigs and sheep had been slaughtered and eaten. People had even broken into the Havana Zoo and eaten the animals and cats like this little kitten had ended up on dinner tables. But nobody was going to eat this cat. You'll just be our little secret, Isabel whispered. Hey, Isabel, Ivan said, making her jump. The cat skittered away underneath the house. Ivan was a year older than Isabel and lived next door. He and Isabel had been friends as long as she could remember. Ivan was lighter skinned than Isabel, with curly dark hair. He wore sandals, shorts, and a short sleeve button-down shirt and a cap with a fancy letter I on it, the logo of the Havana baseball team, the Industriales. He wanted to be a professional baseball player when he grew up, and he was good enough that it wasn't a crazy dream. Ivan plopped to the dusty ground beside Isabel. Look, I found a bit of dead fish on the beach for the cat. Isabel recoiled at the smell, but the kitten came running back, eating greedily from Ivan's hand. She needs a name, Ivan said. Ivan gave names to everything. Stray dogs who wandered to the town, his bicycle, even his baseball glove. How about Jorge, or Javier, or Lazaro? Those are all boy names, Isabel said. Yes, but they are all players for the Lions, and she's a little lion. The Lions was the nickname of the Industriales. Ivan, said his father from the next door, I need your help in the shed. Ivan climbed to his feet. I have to go. We're building a doghouse, he said before sprinting away. Isabel shook her head. Ivan thought he was being sneaky, but Isabel knew exactly what he and his father were building his shed, in their shed, and it wasn't a doghouse. It was a boat. A boat to sail to the United States. Isabel was worried the Castillos were going to get caught. Fidel Castro, the man who ruled Cuba as president and prime minister, wouldn't allow anyone to leave the country, especially not to go to the United States, El Norte, as the Cubans called it, the North. If you were caught trying to leave for El Norte by boat, Castro would throw you in jail. Isabel knew that because her own father had tried and had been thrown in jail for over a year. Isabel noticed her father and grandfather heading down the road toward the city to stand in line for food. She put the little kitten back under her house and ran inside for her trumpet. Isabel loved taking along on trips to Havana to stand on the street corner and play her trumpet for pesos. She never did make much, not because she wasn't good, as her mother liked to say Isabel could play the storm clouds from the sky. People often stopped to listen to her and clap and tap their feet, but the only people who could afford to give her pesos were the tourists, visitors from Canada or Europe or Mexico. Ever since the Soviet Union had collapsed, the only currency most Cubans had were the booklets you got stamped when you went to pick up your food rations from the store. And food ration booklets were pretty worthless anyway. There wasn't enough food to go around whether you had a booklet or not. Isabel caught up with her father and grandfather, then parted ways with them on the Mar Calacón, the broad road that curved along the sea well on Havana Harbor. On one side of the road were blocks of green and yellow and pink and baby blue homes and shops. The paint was peeling and the buildings were old and weathered, but they still looked grand to Isabel. She stood on the wide promenade where it seemed all of Havana was on display. 
Mothers carried babies in slings. Couples kissed under palm trees. Buskers played, rum buskers played rumbas on guitars and drums. Boys took turns diving into the sea. Tourists took pictures. It was Isabel's favorite place in the whole city. Isabel tossed an old ball cap on the ground, on the off chance that one of the tourists actually had a peso to spare. She lifted the trumpet to her lips. As she blew, her fingers tapped out the notes she knew by heart. It was a salsa tune she liked to play, but this time she listened past the music, past the noise of the cars and trucks on the malacón, past the people talking as they walked by, past the crash of waves against the seawall behind her. Isabel was listening for the clave underneath the music, the mysterious hidden beat inside Cuban music that everybody seemed to hear except her, in a regular rhythm that lay over the top of the regular beat like a heartbeat beneath the skin. Try as she might, she had never heard it, never felt it. She listened now intently, trying to hear the heartbeat of Cuba and her own music. What she heard instead was the sound of breaking glass. Mahmoud, Aleppo, Syria, 2015. Mahmoud Bishara was invisible, and that's exactly how he wanted it. Being invisible was how he survived. He wasn't literally invisible. If you really looked at Mahmoud, got a glimpse under the hoodie he kept pulled down over his face, you would see a 12-year-old boy with a long, strong nose, thick black eyebrows, and short, cropped black hair. He was stocky, his shoulders wide and muscular despite the food shortages. But Mahmoud did everything he could to hide his size and his face to stay under the radar. Random death from a fighter jet's missile or a soldier's rocket launcher might come at any moment when you least expected it. To walk around getting noticed by the Syrian army or the rebels fighting them was just inviting trouble. Mahmoud sat in the middle row of desks in his classroom where the teacher wouldn't call on him. The desks were wide enough for three students at each, and Mahmoud sat between two other boys named Ahmed and Nadal. Ahmed and Nadal weren't his friends. Mahmoud didn't have any friends. It was easier to stay invisible that way. One of the teachers walked up and down the hall ringing a handbell, and Mahmoud collected his backpack and went out to find his little brother, Walid. Walid was ten years old and two grades below Mahmoud in school. He, wore, he too wore his black hair cropped short, but he looked more like their mother, with narrower shoulders, thinner eyebrows, and a flatter nose, and bigger ears. His teeth looked too big for his head, and when he smiled, he looked like a cartoon squirrel. Not that Walid smiled much anymore. Mahmoud couldn't remember the last time he'd seen his brother laugh or cry or show any emotion whatsoever. The war had made Mahmoud nervous, twitchy, paranoid. It made his little brother like a robot. Even though their apartment wasn't far away, Mahmoud led Walid on a different route home every day. Sometimes it was the back alleys, there could be fighters in the streets who were always targets for opposition. Bombed out buildings were good too. Mahmoud and Walid could disappear among the heaps of twisted metal and broken cement, and there were no walls to fall on them if an artillery shell went whizzing overhead. If a plane dropped a barrel bomb, though, you needed walls. Barrel bombs were filled with nails and scrap metal, and if you didn't have a wall to duck behind, you'd be shredded to pieces. It hadn't always been this way. Just four years ago, their home city of Aleppo had been the biggest, brightest, most modern city in Syria, a crown jewel of the Middle East. Mahmoud remembered neon malls, glittering skyscrapers, soccer stadiums, movie theaters, museums. Aleppo had history, too, a long history. The old city at the heart of Aleppo was built in the 12th century, and people had lived in the area as early as 8,000 years ago. Aleppo had been an amazing city to grow up in. Until 2011, when the Arab Spring came to Syria. They didn't call it that then. Nobody knew a wave of revolutions would sweep through the Middle East, toppling governments and overthrowing dictators and starting civil wars. All they knew from images on TV and posts on Facebook and Twitter was that people in Tunisia and Libya and Yemen, and Yemen were rioting in the streets. And as each country stood up and said, enough, so did the next one and the next one, until at last the Arab Spring came to Syria. But Syrians knew protesting in the streets was dangerous. Syria was ruled by Bashar al-Assad, who had twice been elected president when no one was allowed to run against him. Assad made people who didn't like him disappear. Forever. Everyone was afraid of what he would do if the Arab Spring swept through Syria. 
There was an old Arabic proverb that said, close the door that brings the wind and relax. And that's exactly what they did. While the rest of Middle East was rioting, Syrians stayed inside and locked their doors and waited to see what would happen. But they hadn't closed their door tight enough. A man in Damascus, the capital of Syria, was imprisoned for speaking out against Assad. Some kids in Dora, a city of southern Syria, were arrested and abused by the police for writing anti-Assad slogans on walls. And then the whole country seemed to go crazy all at once. Tens of thousands of people poured into the streets demanding the release of political prisoners and more freedom for everyone. Within a month, Assad had turned his tanks and soldiers and bombers on the protesters on his own people. And ever since then, all Mahmoud and Walid and anyone else in Syria had known was war. Mahmoud and Walid turned down a different rubble-strewn alley than the day before and stopped dead. Just ahead of them, two boys had another boy up against what was left of a wall, about to take the bag of bread he carried. Mahmoud pulled Walid behind a burned-out car, his heart racing. Incidents like this were common in Aleppo lately. It was getting harder and harder to get food in the city, but for Mahmoud, the scene brought back memories of another time, just after the war had begun. Mahmoud had been going to meet his best friend, Khalid, down a side street, just like this one. Mahmoud found Khalid getting beaten up by two older boys. Khalid was a Shia Muslim in a country of mostly Sunni Muslims. Khalid was clever, smart, always quick to raise his hand in class and always with the right answer. He and Mahmoud had known each other for years, and even though Mahmoud was Sunni and Khalid was Shia, that had never mattered to them. They liked to spend their afternoons and weekends reading comic books and watching superhero movies and playing video games. But right then, Khalid had been curled into a ball on the ground, his hands around his head while the older boys kicked him. Not so smart are you now, you pig, one of them had said. Shia should know their place. This is Syria, not Iran. Mahmoud had bristled. The differences between Sunnis and Shiites was an excuse. The boys had just wanted to beat somebody up. With a battle cry that would have made the wolverine proud, Mahmoud had launched himself at Khalid's attackers. And he had been beaten up just as badly as Khalid. From that day forward, Mahmoud and Khalid were marked. The two older boys became Mahmoud's and Khalid's own personal bullies, delivering repeated beatdowns between classes and after school. That's when Mahmoud and Khalid had learned how valuable it was to be invisible. Mahmoud stayed in the classroom all day, never going to the bathroom or playground. Khalid never answered another question in class, not even when the teacher called on him directly. If the bullies didn't notice you, they didn't hit you. That's when Mahmoud had realized that together he and Khalid were bigger targets. Alone, it was easier to be invisible. It was nothing they ever said to each other, just something they came to understand. And within a year, they had drifted apart, not even speaking to each other as they passed in the hall. A year after that, Khalid had died in an airstrike anyway. It was better not to have friends in Syria in 2015. Mahmoud watched as these boys attacked the boy with the bread, a boy he didn't even know. He felt the stirrings of indignation, of anger, of sympathy. His breath came quick and deep, and his hands clenched into fists. I should do something, he whispered. But he knew better. Head down, hoodie up, eyes on the ground, the trick was to be invisible, blend in, disappear. Mahmoud took his younger brother by the hand, turned around, and found a different way home. If you want to know what happens to Joseph, Isabel, and Mahmoud, pick up a copy of Refugee from your school library, local indie bookstore, or grab it via the link in the description box. And then come back here again next time for another First Chapter Friday. Happy reading! To continue reading Refugee by Alan Gratz, check out a copy from your school library, purchase one from your local indie bookstore, or grab one via the link in the description box below. Then check out the rest of the First Chapter Friday playlist. I have tons of great YA and middle grade stories waiting for you. Please like this video and subscribe so you can stay connected for more great First Chapter Friday videos and other videos you can use in your classroom. Happy reading!